Good morning. Welcome to the Community Presbyterian Church in Pismo Beach on this second Sunday of the holy season of Advent. And we're so thankful to be together here in person as well as uh, being on the internet today on YouTube. And so we always say hello to everybody on YouTube. We love you and miss you and hope you're doing well. Uh, it's an exciting day in the life of our church as we are ordaining and installing two new elders on our church's session. Uh, in, in the Presbyterian Church, the session is so important. Uh, along with working with the pastor, it looks at the vision of the church, uh, at the strategies of the church, what we can do together to glorify God and to be good members of our community. So I'm so thankful for these two folks. Uh, they've been serving on the session for many months now, but we wanted to ordain and install them in person here in the church so you could be part of that instead of doing that on Zoom as well. So we're thankful for that. After church today, we'll be decorating the sanctuary for Christmas. And so if you have a few minutes to, to help with that, get the Christmas spirit, uh, that won't take us long. So we'll be doing that right after the service today. Out the signboard today, it says Advent Season of Hope. And uh, as the front of your uh, bulletin says from Charles Dickens, hope, hope to the last. And uh, the blessing of being a follower of Christ is that gift of hope that we journey with the days of our lives. Um, through good times and in hard times, we hope. And it's so important for us to do that because then we're ambassadors of hope and faith and love in the community. So all of you need to really nurture and hold on to hope so you can bring hope to others. That's part of our call as followers of Jesus Christ. Are there any other announcements this morning? Will all those who are able please stand for the call to worship? You'll find that in your bulletin. Prepare the way, O Zion. Let every hill and valley greet one who comes in glory. O blessed is Christ that came. Let us worship God. I love this first hymn of Advent. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Let us sing together. Please remain standing for our morning prayer of confession, which you'll find in your bulletin. 
Let us pray. Creator God, you looked upon this world and saw we needed an infusion of love and hope. And so you sent us the Christ in whom we experience joy and new life. Forgive us when we take that gift of love for granted. Empower us anew to be ambassadors of Christ's love and compassion to all peoples. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please join me in a time for silent confession. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. may be seated. When I saw the uh, first lesson for today, I thought of my old Scottish friend, Maisie, and uh, she used to always say to me, oh, Pastor Bob, I love it when you read Old Hundredth. And so today we're reading that great Scottish psalm Old Hundredth, Psalm 100. Speaking of hope, listen to these words. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. The Lord is good, and his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Here ends our first lesson, thanks be to God. Now I'd like to invite forward uh, Barbara and Dina for the lighting of the Advent candles today. second Sunday of Advent, and we will light the, can the candle of peace. Last Sunday, we lit the first candle in our Advent wreath, which reminded us of our hope in Christ. We light it again as we remember our Savior, born a king in the line of King David. When Jesus came, today we light the second candle of Advent, the candle of peace. We remember the prophets who spoke of the coming of the Messiah. The prophet Isaiah said he would be called the Prince of Peace. When Jesus came, he taught people the importance of being peacemakers. He said that those who make peace shall be called the children of God. When Christ comes to us by the power of the Holy Spirit, he brings us peace, a peace that is everlasting peace. We light the candle of peace to remind us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, 
and through him we experience peace. And we help make his peace known to the world through our life of faith. Peace is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this candle, we celebrate the peace we find in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, light of the world, prophets said that you would bring peace and save your people from despair. Fill our hearts with peace this Advent season. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word, and to do your will by sharing your peace with family, friends, and strangers. We ask all of this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Barbara and Dina, for bringing more light into our world and into our hearts. And now we come to the ordination and installation of new church officers. And before I invite Ken and Arlene forward, I'd like to share with you uh, some words, a few words from our church's Presbyterian Constitution, part two, the Book of Order. These are words about Christ's ministry. The church's ministry is a gift from Jesus Christ to the whole church. Christ alone rules, calls, teaches, and uses the church as he wills, exercising his authority by the ministry of women and men for the establishment and extension of God's new creation. Christ's ministry is the foundation and standard for all ministry, the pattern of the one who came not to be served, but to serve. The church's ordered ministries described in the New Testament and maintained by this church are deacons and presbyters, ministers of the word and sacrament, and ruling elders. Ordered ministries are gifts to the church to order its life so that the ministry of the whole people of God may flourish. The government of this church is representative, and the right of God's people to elect presbyters and deacons is inalienable and Arlene and Ken were elected by this congregation to serve as ruling elders. To those who are called to exercise special functions in the church, deacons, ruling elders, and ministers of the word, God gives suitable gifts for their various duties. In addition to possessing the necessary gifts and abilities, those who undertake particular ministries should be persons of strong faith dedicated discipleship, and love of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Their manner of life should be a demonstration of the Christian gospel in the church and in the world. They must have the approval of God's people and the concurring judgment of a council of the church. As there were in Old Testament times elders for the government of the people, so the New Testament church provided persons with particular gifts to share in discernment of God's spirit and governance of God's people. Accordingly, congregations should elect persons of wisdom and maturity of faith, having demonstrated skills in leadership and being compassionate in spirit. Ruling elders are named not because they lord it over the congregation, but because they are chosen by the congregation to discern and measure its fidelity to the word of God and to strengthen and nurture its faith and life. Now I'd like to invite forward the two persons this congregation has elected as ruling elders, Ken Teisinger and Arlene Heinrichs. And Ken and Arlene, I'm going to invite you to stand right here behind the communion table and to face the congregation. We are so blessed uh, to have these two people standing here. Uh, Ken is already an ordained elder in the Presbyterian Church, and so he's being installed today. And Arlene, this is her first time to answer a call to be a ruling elder, so she is ordained and installed. And as required of all new elders, 
or they ignore and stall, they are asked to respond at a constitutional question. And the three of us had a class together, was it three years ago? <laughs> or five months ago? I don't know if it's totally shut us down. But I think they remember both of you, and they're going to be able to answer the questions because you're very good, and I do, and I will. <laughs> Ken and Arlene, do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I do. I love this. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you be governed by our church's polity? And will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbor, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Do you promise to further the peace unity and purity of the church will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy intelligence imagination and love will you be a faithful ruling elder watching over the people providing for their worship nurture and service will you share in government and discipline serving in councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite forward Elder Marlene Jones, who is going to share the question of you, the congregation. And I invite you all to please stand. Do we, the members of the church, accept Arlene Heinrich and Kent Heisinger as ruling elders, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation, to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? Amen. Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Amen. Thank you. And Marlene, you can sit up here, because now I'm going to invite all ordained Presbyterian elders, whether you're a member of this church or not, to come forward for our special prayer of ordination and installation. All elders, we invite you forward. We usually, at this point, do what's called a laying on of hands prayer, but with COVID, I thought, you know, laying on of hands, we may not want to do that. <laughs> so what we're going to do is gather a circle around them, and... Uh, we're going to gather in a circle around them, and, and you're going to, instead of laying your hands on them, you're going to send your heart, the love of your heart to them. And so, Ken and Arlene, I want you to feel the love in these elders. And they're wise people, and they're going to be such great resources for you in your ministry here at our church. And now, friends, let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for calling Arlene and Ken to the office of elder of this dear church in Pismo Beach. We ordained Arlene and installed both she and Ken as elders. We thank you for the enthusiastic willingness to share their time and talent here, to share their faith, hope, and love in this church family. God of love and mercy, help them both to sense your Holy Spirit working within their hearts and minds. Enable each of them to continue eagerly embracing Christ's teaching to love and serve this church guided by your grace. 
God of compassion, as Arlene is ordained in Spanish Saul. Set not above others, but set apart in order to serve you in a specific way. May they each feel your sustaining and empowering love moving through our hearts to theirs. And thus, from this day forth, serving as ambassadors of your love and justice in the community. Oh Lord, we thank you for calling Arlene and Ken to this ministry and for the answer they each have given by their very presence here this morning. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Oh God, may Arlene and Ken's words and deeds give all glory to you and speak the truth in love. May they help you, oh God, and help us to build your kingdom of justice and peace on earth as it is in heaven. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> My friends, you are elders now in the church. Yeah, give everybody, give them an elbow. You are now elders in this church. And God bless you all. Second lesson, second lesson this morning is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, reading at chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 3 to 11. Let us listen together for the word of God. <clears throat> Paul writes, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy thankful for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel thus about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruits of righteousness, which come through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Here ends our second lesson, thanks be to God. Seeing that we were reflecting on a letter of Paul written from prison, made me think about what, what works have I read in college or grad school or seminary that were written by people in prison that still have power today. And I remembered a few of these, of these works. First, The Consolation of Philosophy by Anasius Boethus. Boethus spent most of his life as one of Italy's most influential philosophers and statesmen. He reached the peak of his career while heading the government of the Ostrogoth ruler Theodoric in the 520s. But his fortunes later took a severe turn when he was unjustly accused of treason and sentenced to death. <clears throat> As Boethus languished in prison and pondered his eminent demise, he put pen to paper and wrote Consolation of Philosophy, an elegant examination of the nature of evil, free will, and divine providence. Consolation of Philosophy went on to become one of the most widely studied texts of the Middle Ages. Another classic written in prison is the book Travels by Marco Polo. A, uh, a man named Andrews of the History Channel writes, a few years after returning from his 24-year trek through Asia, Marco Polo was captured 
while leading a Venetian galley into battle against the rival Italian city-state of Genoa. Confined to prison, the 44-year-old merchant passed the time by regaling his fellow inmates with tales of his journeys in China and his years spent in the employ of the Mongol ruler Kublai Khan. His epic travels and often embellished travelogue sealed Marco Polo's legacy as one of the world's greatest explorers and provided many Europeans with their first glimpse into the wonders of the Far East. The 17th century gave us The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Originally a tinker by trade, England's John Bunyan first made his name in the late 1650s when he found religion and became a popular separatist preacher. Along with drawing crowds and followers, Bunyan's stirring sermons soon drew the ire of the monarchy, which considered it illegal for him to hold religious gatherings that did not conform to the Anglican Church. In 1660, John Bunyan was arrested and confined to a jail in Bedford. His crime only carried a three-month sentence, but since he refused to quit preaching, he eventually spent more than 12 years behind bars. During his imprisonment, he used his experiences with state persecution to begin work on The Pilgrim's Progress, and he published the work in 1678 after his release from jail and the book went on to become runaway success. It's often cited as one of the landmark novels of the 17th century. Moving forward in history, I'm sure many of you have read all or portions of the letter from the Birmingham City Jail by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In April of 1963, Dr. King was tossed into a Birmingham, Alabama jail cell on charges of leading a public demonstration without a permit. During a nine-day jail sentence, Reverend King used the margins of newspapers and even bits of jailhouse toilet paper to draft a response to a group of Birmingham pastors that had denounced his fight against segregation and labeled him an outside agitator. The eloquent 7,000-word essay use quotes from St. Thomas and Thomas Jefferson and others. To examine the nature of unjust laws and civic responsibility and included the now immortal line, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Those words written, composed of the Birmingham City Jail. King's associates smuggled the scattered scraps of paper out of the jail and typed them up a few days before his release. The letter from the Birmingham City Jail soon appeared in publications across the nation and went on to become a touchstone of the American Civil Rights Movement. And finally, Autobiography by Nelson Mandela. Before he was South Africa's first black president, Nelson Mandela was inmate number 46664 at Robben Island Prison, one of three prisons in which he eventually spent almost three decades of of his life during hard time. In 1974, while confined to an eight by seven foot cell, he began secretly writing an autobiography, documenting his years as an anti-apartheid activist and revolutionary. After completing the book, Mandela buried the original copy in the prison garden. The autobiography remained unreleased until 1994, when Mandela used it to help shape his famous book, Long Walk to Freedom. Friends, one of the causes of greatest heartache during Mandela's years in prison was being separated from his two daughters. I can't imagine anything more painful for a beloved father to endure. His daughters were just one and three years old when he was locked up in Robben Island Prison. They weren't allowed to see him until they were 16 years old. And so the only way he could be a parent to them was through writing letters. Every day at the prison, the men were locked into their cells at 3.30 p.m. 
and not let out until 5.30 a.m. the next morning. In later years, Nelson Mandela was asked what he did during all that time in his cell, and he said he read and wrote letters. When his daughters were 10 or 11 years old, Mandela wrote the following words to them in response to their heartbreaking question, Daddy, when are you coming home? In his letter, Mandela said to them, I do not know, my darlings, when I will return. You will remember that in the letter I wrote in years past, I told you that the white judge said I should stay in jail for the rest of my life. It may be long before I come back, but it may be soon. Nobody knows when it will be, not even the judge who said I should be kept here. But I am certain that one day I will be back at home to live in happiness with you until the end of my days. Friends, 21 years after he wrote those words, Nelson Mandela was freed from prison and was reunited with his now adult daughters. Just four years later, they saw their father elected president of South Africa. Thanks be to God. In our second lesson this morning, we heard verses from what has been called the Apostle Paul's love letter to the church at Philippi. The letter has been described as Paul's most personal letter to any of the churches he founded and pastored. As one scholar put it, the pages of Philippians are literally saturated with Paul's deep love, affection, and longing for the church family. He was longing for them from prison. As Nelson Mandela did centuries after him, yes, Paul too wrote his letter from prison. And he spent anywhere from three to eight years in prison by Rome. Somebody has said that reading Paul's letter to the Philippians is kind of like eavesdropping on somebody else's love letters. Really, it's easy to see why when you read through the letter. Paul said to the church at Philippi, I hold you in my heart. I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. You are my beloved, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Friends, in the specific passage we heard a few minutes ago from Philippians 1, 3 to 11, several things about Paul's state of mind as he writes this love letter to his church struck me. First, even though Paul was in prison, when he wrote this letter to the church at Philippi, just as he was when he wrote the letters of Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon, Paul is filled with gratitude. Yes, Paul writes Philippians not in a spirit of bitterness, hopelessness, or resignation, but in a spirit of thanksgiving. Says Paul as he puts pen to paper, I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for you. Why does Paul say such loving words? Because in good times and sorrowful times, the Christians in Philippi have kept the faith. They have defended the gospel. Just imagine Paul's joy in knowing that his work among them, his ministry, was not in vain. And arising out of this gratitude, we also see in Paul a deep sense of confidence that the church will continue to survive and thrive. Indeed, a special relationship has been established between Paul and the members of the church in Philippi, as exemplified so beautifully by this statement to them. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Jesus. Friends, despite Paul's captivity, his loss of freedom, his awareness that he likely will die in prison, Paul's unshakable faith enables him to pray, not only for himself, but for others. And his prayer for them is rooted in love, the love a parent has for his adult children. Said Paul, I pray that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best so that in the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless. 
Friends, this is another important reminder that our life in Christ is not just a matter of the heart. It's also a matter of the mind. In fact, true faith in Christ never separates the heart from the mind. Paul suggests that the love of God, uh, the embrace of love without insider knowledge, can cause and perpetuate great harm in the world, can make one impure or guilty of not being faithful to God's teaching. Remember, he says that having overflowing love with insight and knowledge leaves one pure and blameless. The embrace of love without insider knowledge causes many problems, such as those people who try to live a life of faith today divorced from the lessons and knowledge of science. Or those who condemn others, religion or culture or very humanity by misusing the Bible. Yes, all fall short who readily declare, oh, I love God but reject or mock people who they forget are also made in God's image. Paul says our love of God must be characterized by knowledge and full insight in part so we don't make the same mistake Paul did when he persecuted followers of Jesus before his own conversion. For Paul, the life of faith marked by a love which overflows with knowledge and insight, leads to a harvest of righteousness, i.e. to the establishment of a community which praises God and shares Christ's justice and peace in the world. You could say, in the world of darkness, it establishes a community of light. A light that burns in simple candles and a light that burns in your heart. Thanks be to God for the ministry and faith of Paul. The words he wrote from prison continue to bless the world and continue to bless us. A continual reminder to be people of love who never divorce love and faith from knowledge and insight. I want to close this Advent morning with a poem by an unknown author entitled Loving Words. As I reread the poem this past week, it reminded me of the time the Apostle Paul took to share loving words with the church at Philippi. Here in a simple poem is a reminder of the power we all have to bless another person's life with our words as Paul did. The author writes, loving words will cost but little journeying up the hill of life, but they make the weak and weary stronger, braver for the strife. Do you count them only trifles? What to earth are sun and rain? Never was a kind word wasted. Never was one said in vain. When the cares of life are many and its burdens heavy grow, Think of those close beside you. If you love them, tell them so. What you count of little value has an almost magic power. And beneath their cheering sunshine, hearts will blossom like a flower. So as up life's hill we journey, let us scatter all the way kindly words. For they are sunshine in the dark and cloudy day. Grudge no loving word or action as along through life you go. There are weary ones around you. If you love them, tell them so. Thanks be to God for the Apostle Paul's lessons to us at Advent and a reminder of our power to love. Amen.
Now let us take a, a moment to turn to God in prayer in this beautiful Advent day. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of this day, the gift of friendship. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of Ken and Arlene, their leadership in our church. We thank you for all our elders and deacons. We thank you, O oh God, for the chance to come together and, and worship, to open our hearts to your spirit, to take a moment in our busy lives just to come and stop and pause and consider this wonderful life we are blessed to live. Thank you, O oh God, for giving us work to do, for people to love. Thank you for the reminder of the Apostle Paul that, that no circumstance can turn us around, not even imprisonment, from being your people. Help us, O oh God, in this Advent season to let hope abound in our hearts, that we might bless another who needs a word of hope or love or kindness. Thank you for the ability you give us, O oh God, to share kind words. Help us never to take for granted how a kind word to a, a person uh, at work, a person in a restaurant serving us, a person we meet on the street, never to take a kind word for granted because we know, O oh God, that we can, you are able to work through us to lift up others. So help us, O oh God, to embrace that calling as well as we journey in our lives. God, as a church family, we uh, continue to pray for people who are having a hard time uh, during the holiday season. For some, it's a very depressing and lonely time. There are many reasons that uh, people may have something in their past that is triggered by the holiday season. And so we ask, oh God, that you would lead us to these people that we may wrap our arms around them with kindness and friendship. Help us, oh God, to be sensitive to those around us who might need a helping hand, a helping a, a heart in need of healing and friendship. We pray for all those children in our community and around our country that are dealing with uh, serious disease in this holiday season. Especially we pray for 14-year-old Ayla being treated for leukemia, uh, being airlifted to Minnesota. We pray for her and for her family in North Dakota. And we pray for her grandmother uh, for whom this is a very difficult time. Dear God, we pray for all those who've been suffering some physical illness, including Leslie Carlson, who's been suffering with severe headaches. We pray also for her son, Elijah, who like many teenagers is finding this a time of stress and challenge. We pray your peace, your strength, your healing love for all these people. We pray for everyone here this morning, each of us with challenges in our life. We thank you, O oh God, that you remind us that we never journey alone. We journey in friendship. We journey as a community together. Help us not be embarrassed to share uh, if something is difficult in our life, share it with each other, that we might get support and help. We pray, oh God, prayers of joy. We thank you for the music that Kathy Wilding lifts up in us as we uh, praise you. Again, we thank you for Ken and Arlene. We thank you, oh God, for many that this season is a time of family reunion, of kids coming home from college, of uh, families getting together who haven't seen each other all year and sometimes in many years. We ask, oh God, that we pray that all reunions would be safe and uh, aware that COVID is still among us, that we protect each other. We pray for all those who are traveling in this holy season. We pray for all those who are watching this service on YouTube today. We love you and we give thanks for you too. 
Dear God, help us, help us always to share kind words for it just might save a life. Hear us now, great God, as we pray together as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let's all stand for our closing hymn this morning. Number 443, O Christ the Great Foundation. Thank you.